Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've been here twice before. Once to uh, speak, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago. I once to listen to a debate when I was an undergraduate. And speaking in that debate um, were Jeremy Thorpe of scandal fame and um, Lord Hailsham, Quentin Hogg. Quentin Hogg. I can't remember anything about it. I wasn't a member of the union um, because politics wasn't really at the forefront of my mind then, and I thought it was full of politicians. But it's very nice to be back here and um, uh, occupying this, <laughs> this part of the room. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm going to start by reading a little bit from uh, the book that isn't published yet, The Secret Commonwealth, which is coming out in October, or will be coming out in October, if I finish the editing in time. Uh, which I promised to do by Friday. <laughs> um, I'm going to read the opening, or, or, or part of the opening chapter. Um, if anybody's read the La Belle Sauvage, the first part of the Book of Dust, which was published in uh, 2017, um, you might remember that Lyra, in that story, Lyra was a baby. She was about six months old, and she didn't have any sort of agency in the story. She was very much the um, object of action rather than the subject of action. Uh, in this book, however, we've moved on 20 years. Lyra is that old, she's 20 years old. She's an undergraduate. And, um, well, this is what happens as the story opens. Pantalaimon the demon of Lyra Bellacqua, now called Lyra Silvertongue, lay along the windowsill of Lyra's little study bedroom in St. Sophia's College in a state as far from thought as he could get. He was aware of the cold draught from the ill-fitting sash window beside him, and of the warm naphtha light on the desk below the window, and of the scratching of Lyra's pen, and of the darkness outside. It was the cold and the dark he most wanted just then, as he lay there, turning over to feel the cold, now on his back, now on his front, the desire to go outside became even stronger than his reluctance to speak to Lyra. Open the window, he said finally. I want to go out. Lyra's pen stopped moving. She pushed her chair back and stood up. Pantalaimon could see her reflection in the glass suspended over the Oxford night. He could even make out the expression of mutinous unhappiness. I know what you're going to say, he said. Of course I'll be careful. I'm not stupid. In some ways you are, she said. She reached over him and slid the window up, propping it open with the nearest book. Don't, he began, don't shut that window. Yes, Pan, just sit there freezing till Pan decides to come home. I'm not stupid at all. Go on, bugger off. He flowed out and into the ivy covering the wall of the college. Only the faintest rustle came to Lyra's ears, and then only for a moment. Pan didn't like the way they were speaking to each other, or rather, not speaking. In fact, these words were the first they'd exchanged all that day. But he didn't know what to do about it, and neither did she. Halfway down the wall, he caught a mouse in his needle-sharp teeth and wondered about eating it, but gave it a surprise and let it go. He crouched on the thick ivy branch, relishing all the smells, all the wayward gusts of air, all the wide night open around him. But he was going to be careful. He had to be careful about two things. One was the patch of cream white fur that covered his throat, which stood out with unfortunate clarity against the rest of his red-brown pine marten fur. But it wasn't hard to keep his head down or to run fast. The other reason for being careful was much more serious. No one who saw him would think for a moment that he was a pine marten. He looked like a pine marten in every respect, but he was a demon. It was very hard to say where the difference lay, but any human being in Lyra's world would have known it at once, as surely as they knew the smell of coffee or the colour red. And a person, apart from their demon, or a demon alone with their person nowhere in sight, was something uncanny, eldritch, impossible. No ordinary human beings could separate in that way, though reputedly witches could. The power that Lyra and Pan had was peculiar to them, and had been dearly bought eight years before in the world of the dead. Since coming home to Oxford after that strange adventure, they had told no one about it, and exercised the most scrupulous care to keep it a secret. But sometimes, and more often recently, 
They simply had to get away from each other. So now Pan let, kept to the shadows, and as he moved through the shrubs and the long grass that bordered the great expanse of the neatly mown university parks, feeling the night with all his senses, he made no sound and kept his head low. It had rained earlier that evening, and the earth was soft and moist under his feet. When he came to a patch of mud, he crouched down and pressed his throat and chest into it so as to conceal the treacherous patch of cream-white fur. Leaving the parks, he darted across Banbury Road at the moment when there were no pedestrians on the pavement and only one distant vehicle in sight. Then he slipped into the garden of one of the large houses on the other side and then through hedges, over walls, under fences, across lawns, making for Jericho and the canal, only a few streets away. Well, he gets to Jericho and he moves on to the ox pens. Now, the ox pens um, are where the first big incident of the story takes place. Pan sees a murder happening. And, of course, he's very shocked, but he's even more shocked when uh, the victim, if not quite dead, calls him and gives him his wallet. Take that away, he said. Hide it. Don't let them have it. So Pan does that. And he goes all the way back to Lyra's room in St. Sophia's College. And now Pan had to carry this wallet all the way back to St. Sophia's College and Lyra's bed. He gripped it between his teeth and pushed his way up to the edge of the rushes. It wasn't heavy, but it was awkward. And what was worse, it was saturated with the smell of another person. Sweat, cologne, smoke leaf. It was being too close to someone who wasn't Lyra. He got it as far as the fence around the allotment gardens, and then he stopped for a rest. Well, he would have to take his time. There was plenty of night left. The bells of Oxford were striking two o'clock when Pan climbed in. He laid the wallet on the table, working his mouth this way and that to relieve his aching jaw before pulling out the book with which he'd propped open the window for him. He knew it. It was a novel called The Hyperchorasmians, and Pan thought Lyra was paying it far too much attention. He let it fall to the floor and then cleaned himself meticulously before pushing the wallet into the bookcase and out of sight. Then he leapt up lightly onto her pillow. In the ray of moonlight that she came through a gap in the curtains, he crouched and gazed at her sleeping face. Her cheeks were flushed, her dark gold hair was damp. Those lips that had whispered to him so often and kissed him and kissed Will too were compressed a little frown hovered on her brow, coming and going like clouds in a windy sky. They all spoke of things that were not right, of a person who was becoming more and more unreachable to him as he was to her. And he had no idea what to do about it. All he could do was lie down close against her flesh. That at least was still warm and welcoming. At least they were still alive. And that's how the story opens. And for the rest of it, you'll have to wait until October, if I finish it in time. Thank you so much for the extract and for coming here today. I wanted to start by asking about his dark materials and La Belle Sauvage as well. And it's quite a big question, but what inspired you to create this world of Lyra's Oxford? Uh, what inspired me to create the world in which um, the story takes place? Well, laziness. <laughs> I'm too lazy to go to places and look around and see what real places are like, so I prefer to sit at home at my desk and make them up. I'm semi-serious with that answer, by the way. Um, I, I have written books where, in order to write which I have gone to, for example, the East End of London or um, uh, Prague or various other places, but um, I found I could get just as much of the sort of information I needed from pictures, photographs, maps, and um, the Bodleian Library. I, I didn't go to the Arctic to write Northern Lights, I did try um, to the extent of applying for a grant to pay for the journey to Svalbard and back, but the, the um, body I asked said, no, you can't. So I went to the Bodleian Library instead, <laughs> which proved entirely satisfactory. <laughs> and then when you finished The Amber Spyglass over 10 years ago, did you know that you were going to write a prequel to the series? 
Uh, when I finished um, the Amber Spyglass, which I did in about the year 2000, I think, um, uh, I'd spent seven years with it. I'd spent seven years making up this world and writing the long story that went through the three books. Um, and I thought I'd finished. Um, I, I could have gone on and I could have written, you know, endless Lyra Saga book 13 or whatever it was and so on. Um, I dare say the publishers would have liked that, but I, um, I thought I'd finished the story. Um, and, and I had, and I didn't intend to write any more, but, but my publisher tempted me to, with the idea of writing a little book um, about Lyra's Oxford, which would have a map in it. So I did that in about, I don't know, 2005 or something. And that worked very well, and so I decided to write a book suggested by my son, who said he'd like to know how Lee Scoresby, the balloonist, and Yorick Birnison, the bear, the armoured bear, first met. Because when we see them in Northern Lights, they're old comrades, old um, fighting companions, and they've known each other for a long time. So that idea intrigued me. So I wrote Once Upon a Time in the North. Um, it was a little blue book. And um, then, well, time went by, and I wrote other things. And then I th began to think of this story. And I, uh, it's often a, um, not an incident or a, um, a plot twist or anything that brings me into a story. It's a character in a setting. And whereas the setting of the first book was Oxford and the North, because the North intrigued me such a lot, uh, the setting of this one was going to be Central Asia. Again, where I'd never been, where I have no intention of going because I'd much prefer to sit in the Bodleian Library. Um, but that intrigues me. And all the, um, the, 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 the sights and the sounds and the um, smells of spices and all that sort of thing that uh, evoke that idea of Central Asia for me. Um, paintings too, paintings by the Russian painter Nicholas Rurich, uh, of whom, about whom there's a very good website with all his pictures on it. That was the starting point. And so I began to find myself telling a, another story about Lyra and about another character called Malcolm, Malcolm Polstead, the boy in, the, in La Belle Sauvage, the boy whose canoe is called La Belle Sauvage. And I'm still doing it. Um, I wanted to continue by asking about the TV adaptation of his dark materials. How involved are you in this and how willing are you for details in the book to be changed in the adaptation? Well, fortunately, there's no law that says when a TV adaptation or a film adaptation is made of a book, the book has to be withdrawn and burned. The book is still there. Um, so in a sense, I, I, I'm happy to let it be adapted into any, any medium, and it's been several things already. It's been a highly um, complex and produced audio book with a full cast. Um, and I was doing the narration. I, I, I kind of wanted to do, the, I wanted to do the bear. <laughs> but because I was doing the narration, they had to have somebody else to do the bear, so I couldn't do that. It's been, that, it's been, um, it's been a stage play at the National Theatre and elsewhere. It's been uh, a movie, well, part of it has. Um, it's been a radio dramatization, eh, and it's now being a television adaptation. Um, I've been involved in this one rather more than I was with the film. Um, I think this one has a chance of telling the whole story, which the film didn't. And actually, no film can, because, uh, because it's a matter of length, isn't it? To, uh, to read the whole story alive, aloud takes something like 13 hours. Uh, but you, you can't make any film that's 13 hours long. You have to make it sort of between um, 90 minutes and 140 minutes, roughly. Uh, so you can't tell the whole story. Uh, but it, the, this new long-form TV that they've got now, um, which I love as a form, um, seems to me to have the potential to tell the story properly. So I was very happy to see that um, start to happen. Um, as an executive producer, I don't know if I get a chair with the word executive producer on it. I haven't, <laughs> haven't seen that yet. But um, uh, yeah, yeah, I've been involved at all stages. And on the topic of adaptations, The Golden Compass was adapted to a movie, as you said, in 2007, but it was criticised for diluting the theme of the abuse of power in a fictionalised version of the church mm. that was present in the book. Were you disappointed in the film for these reasons, and do you hope 
that this theme comes out more strongly in the TV series? Well, the film met several problems. Um, one of which is the one I just described, the storytelling one. You can't tell the whole story in, um, you know, 100 minutes. Um, another problem it met was the... Uh, um, the religious objections to it, which were mainly by, made by people or organisations that hadn't read the book and had no intention of reading the book, because they, noted they, they knew they'd go to hell if they did, so they didn't want to do that. Um, but they, they don't learn these bits, they never learn. If you make a fuss about something and try to prevent people from reading it or seeing it, they'll want to read it and see it even more than they did before. So it's, it's a hopeless um, strategy that, they've, that they, um, they take up, and it, and it didn't work. I think the book was banned in a few American states. Um, it, the film was objected to in America by a body called the Catholic League, uh, and that probably hit the box office in the States. It didn't, didn't affect it anywhere else, but it, it didn't do very well in America. So are you seeing these themes of the abuse of power? Sorry? Are you seeing the themes of the abuse of power coming out more strongly in the TV series compared to the film? Uh, in the new book? No, in the adaptation. The TV oh, I see. I see, sorry. Um, in the TV adaptation, yes, it will, because there's time for it. And because they recognise that it is a, a, a complex world that I've set up, and it's not something that you can skip through lightly and rely on a bit of cliché to take you over, um, you know, what the, the sort of behaviour I'm describing. Um, but it, it is an interesting business telling a story on the screen. You, um, you can do so much so, instant, so instantly with a picture um, that takes a long time to describe on the page or a long time to read and maybe Maybe people skip all my wonderful descriptions anyway, I don't know. Uh, on the screen they won't have to, they can just see. Uh, but, but it's a different way of storytelling. Um, you, the, the kind of things you can show in a picture or in visual movement or uh, with, a, with a landscape um, are the things that tend to get prioritised. Not so easy to deal with the things that go on inside someone's head. Um, so each of these media has, their, has its own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the one I know best and the one I like best and the, one, the only one I can do really is, is the novel, uh, which does allow you to go both inside a character's head and outside it to see Lyra from her own point of view and from the point of view of the omniscient narrator, who is a figure um, who has been much maligned in literary criticism uh, for quite some time now, but who I find is the most interesting way of telling a story. The, the omniscient narrator who sees, well, presumably they're omniscient, they see everything. Um, so they can both speak and comment on, they can both narrate and criticize. Um, now, what is this curious consciousness that can do these things? It proves to me, it, it, I, I, I realized this earlier, the narrator, an omniscient narrator, it cannot be a human being. It must be some other entity, because a human being can't do what the omniscient narrator can do. A human being can't go into somebody else's mind and say what they're thinking, but the narrator can. Um, is the narrator... Well, the narrator isn't the author, you see. That's a mistake um, uh, young people sometimes make. Um, it's not the author's voice, it's the voice of the narrator, who is him or herself, a character, a made-up character, just as much as the named personages in the book are. Um, now, is this a male voice or a female voice? It can be both. Um, is it, it's old and young. It's sceptical and um, credulous. It's uh, sentimental and cynical. It's all these things. I find it the most fascinating thing to inhabit this so-called omniscient narrator. And is it omniscient? Is he or she? Or does, he, does, do they know everything? Um, well, there comes a point in, your, in the telling of story when you don't know everything. You don't know what he was thinking or she was thinking. Um, so I, that's really the fundamental storytelling question for me. It was summed up brilliantly by the playwright and film director David Mamet, um, who said the two most 
important questions a director of a film has to ask are, what do I tell the actors and where do I put the camera? Um, well, you don't have actors in a novel. Um, they do what you tell them to do. But you do have to decide where to put the camera, how close you're going to see it from, what you're going to tell the reader about what you see through this camera eye. It's, it's the most fascinating, the most curious, the least explored, I think, um, aspect of storytelling. And um, I, I, I relish it. That's the thing I enjoy most. Going back to what you said about your books being banned, your work has been cited as an example of fiction that's far more worthy of the bonfire than Harry Potter and the Catholic Herald. And you continue your themes of the abuse of power of religious institutions in La Belle Sauvage as well. Mm -hmm. Would you describe this message as one of the main aims of the two series and how do you think it relates to having importance in today's world? I think um, the story does r relate in some ways to th things and events and tendencies we can see in the, in, in the present world. Um, but I didn't write it for that purpose. I didn't, I, I didn't you know, want to make a political comment about something and made up a story to fit it. It doesn't work like that for me anyway. Uh, I think if you're going to, take a, you're going to do anything for some years, and I knew this would take me years, it took me seven years. This new story is probably going to take me even more. If you're going to do a task like that with all of your attention and all of your um, stamina and all your energy, if you're going to do that for seven years, it's going to be something you take seriously. And the things you take seriously will come through in the telling. I don't think you can avoid that. I don't think you can avoid um, your personal, um, well, morality or system of ethics or whatever it is you can't, you can't, that'll be there in the story, whether you want it to or not. Um, your attitudes to things like um, the importance of courtesy or uh, the value of the natural world, those will come through. I don't know if that's an answer to the question you asked, but <laughs> that, that's the sort of thing, that's the way in which I deal with things anyway. And do you hope to continue this theme throughout the rest of your new series as Sorry? well? Sorry? Do you hope to continue this theme throughout the rest of your new series as well? Well, the, it, it will, whether, whether I want it to or not, for the reasons I've just outlined. Um, but if, if, the new, if the new trilogy, the current trilogy, has a theme, um, and I always discover, if a book has a theme, it, I discover it part way through. Don't never start with a theme. Uh, I kind of, it sort, sort of emerges. If the new one has a theme, it's the importance of um, imagination in the way we see things. Uh, I'm a devotee of William Blake and um, his view of the importance of the imagination is well known. Well, I, I completely agree with him. Um, there are various ways in which the imagination is under attack at the present time in our uh, world, and uh, I wanted to, um, I wanted the story, I hoped the story would say something about the importance of the imagination. So moving in a different direction to your activism on several public issues, you've campaigned against the age and gender labelling of books, saying that no publisher should announce on the cover of any book the sort of readers um, the book would prefer. Can you elaborate a bit on the work that you've done in this area? Uh, about libraries in particular? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, the library, the public library, um, is a great institution. It's a, it's a kind of free university. It's a source of information and, uh, and delight and knowledge and um, all those things, we know that. But the wondrous thing is that it was, the public library system was set up um, free. It was there for everyone. You could, wherever you moved in, the, in this country, there was a public library and you could join it and you could get a ticket and you could borrow books. Uh, just wonderful. Um, over the past, what, 20 years or so, it's been under attack, like all institutions, public institutions, that don't make a profit. Um, it's got to make a profit if it's, any, if it's got any value at all in the eyes of 
some politicians now and some newspapers. Uh, well, the public library won't make a profit. Um, hospitals don't make a profit. They're not for making a profit. Nor do schools. They don't make a profit. They're not for making a profit. They're for charitable purposes. Um, you, you set up a school originally because you thought it was a good thing that there should be a school. You didn't do it to make money. You set up a hospital in the days when hospitals were first set, I suppose the Middle Ages, because it was a charitable thing. It was a good thing to help the sick and the poor. That's why you did it. You didn't expect to make money out of it. You put up a library because it was a good thing to do. Because the people would benefit. The, the society as a general would benefit from having works of literature, works of um, entertainment, works of information, works of reference available free. You did it because it was a good thing to do. Now that hasn't changed. But what's changed is our attitude to doing things that are good things to do. We don't care about whether they're good things to do or not. Do they make any money? No. Away with them. That's been the attitude. And I blame it on, well, Mrs Thatcher, obviously. And I blame it on the Chicago School of Economics, obviously. And I blame it on every rat and rogue and scoundrel that's been in office for quite some time now. Um, away with them, I say. And within libraries and bookstores, you've also campaigned quite a lot against labelling books for a specific <laughs> age or gender. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about that work. Yeah, this was a fight I enjoyed. <laughs> I liked this one. There was a scheme about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, um, put about by some, there were many children's publishers. Um, they thought it would be a good idea if they put an, an age range on the covers of their books, saying, you know, this book is for 9 to 10 year olds or something. And many of us who wrote the books were furious. And we struggled very hard against it. And we made speeches and we wrote things and we had web. And we did all. Our objection to it was quite simple. We don't know who will want to read our books. We don't know who this book is for. To say it's not for, you know, it's not, it's not for anyone below 10 is a silly idea because there might be children of eight or seven or six who would enjoy reading it. Um, and it was particularly iniquitous in the case of children who didn't read very well. Um, your real age might be 11 or 12, but your reading age might be kind of less than that. But you, to, 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 read a, to read a book which said it was for seven or eight-year-olds would mark you out, it would stigmatize, you'd be mocked for it. You'd be put children off reading for life. The whole idea of having someone turning away your readers before they even get to you was, was uh, abominable. And we said so when we made the publishers change their mind. The, um, the reason for, for doing that was um, a financial one, of course. It was, it was the time when supermarkets were beginning to sell books. Um, it was after the end of the net book agreement, which um, regulated the price at which books could be sold. That ended about the same time as Northern Lights came out, actually, in, in the middle 90s. And it meant that books could be discounted and sold cheaply. Um, it meant that other people than booksellers could buy a stack of books from a wholesaler, shove them up next to the baked beans, and sell them cheap. And um, they needed to be able to put them on the right shelf, basically. They needed to be able to say to their 17-year-old work experience, boy or girl, um, see these, this number on the back of the book, put it up on the shelf with that number. That's all they, that, that, that was the only sort of engagement they had with the book. A proper bookseller would read the books and decide for themselves. It is actually a help for parents or anyone buying a book to go to the sh shelf that's likely to have the sort of books you want on it. But that's different. It's different for a book to be on a shelf that a, a librarian or a teacher or a bookseller has decided is suitable for that age range. But for the book itself to say, keep out, I'm not for you, seemed utterly wrong. Um, so we did away with it. And if they're up for another fight, so are we. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. Um, going back to your criticism of the government, you have described one of the causes of Brexit as the country's post-Second World War delusion that it is still a great power. Um, 
it, how else do you think this mentality has affected the current political arena, and how do you think the country can move past well, the, the, the post-truth thing. Um, yeah, the, the post-Second World War delusion that it's still a great power. Oh, that, yes. Uh, we've, we've been under, Britain has been under the delusion all my lifetime um, that it was a great power. I well remember, as a small boy of about seven, um, in what was then called Southern Rhodesia, uh, we lived there briefly because my father was in the RAF and we still had an empire and service men and women were sent to various parts of the empire. He was sent to there and um, I, I was there during the coronation of the Queen and we all got a little medal. I think everybody got a medal. Um, what we'd done to get the medal, I don't know, apart from being born, but anyway, this was, this was a symbol of the empire and this, the greatness of our empire. And I spent a lot of my childhood going around one end of the empire to the other, from Australia to London, back to, back to um, Africa, uh, all on board ship, because that's the way you traveled in those days. So I was very much um, surrounded by this idea that Britain was a great country whose influence reached all around the globe and the sun never set on, and so on. And it's an absolute fantasy, an utter fantasy. In 1956, there occurred the Suez Crisis when um, Colonel Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal and England and France got in a frightful stew and decided to teach the chappy a lesson. And um, it was ended in humiliation, of course, because the United States didn't, um, didn't support um, this move and we, we had to retreat. Uh, and the canal stayed in Egyptian hands. That should have been a wake-up call. We should have realized then that the empire was, a, was, a, was, a, was gone. It was a ghost. It didn't really exist. But we didn't. And we've still got idiots like Johnson and um, Dominic Raab talking about the buccaneering attitude to trade. We're going to go all over the world and buccaneer people. I don't know what you do, slicing their heads off or something. Um, it's, it's nonsense and it comes directly out of, because I experienced this, it comes directly out of prep school history in the 50s, um, which were full of that sort of rubbish. Um, I remember it well. Um, and it's all over and we should realise it and grow up a bit. But we haven't yet. And Brexit's not helping. <laughs> well, it's um, in a terrible state. <laughs> Finally, before moving on to questions from the audience, I wanted to ask what's next for you and where do you see yourself headed in the next few years, particularly once you finish the Book of Dust trilogy? Well, I've got to finish it first and then I'll decide what next. But it's been, it's been um, occurring to me for some time that unless I write down what I remember um, before I forget it, it'll be lost. And my childhood was interesting, very interesting to me anyway, and that experience I just mentioned about going all over the place on ships and so on, that's something that nobody will have, or very few people will have had. And it might be interesting to write about that. Uh, I also want to write about my first encounter with poetry uh, at school, about the friends at school who, um, whom I fooled about with. Uh, there was an occasion with fireworks in the ladies' lavatory, I remember. I think the statute of limitations is probably going to cover that one. Um, so I, I'm going to write a memoir. Uh, but uh, after that, well, I don't know. I'll keep on, though. As long as I can move my hand and stagger up to my study and sit at my desk, I'll, I'll keep on with it. It's the great thing about being a writer. Don't be a ballet dancer. Your knees give out just as you're learning the job. Um, and, you know, if you're a footballer or something, you, you, you have a terrible knee injury and you've got to give it up. Um, be something where you can stay sitting down, that's my advice. <laughs> <laughs> no heavy lifting, no violent physical movements, and you can keep at it until you're 70. Thank you. Um, on that note, I think we can move to audience questions. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Could we go to the hand in the second row? Hello, thanks so much for coming. Um, I wondered if you could speak a little bit about 
um, the most fascinating aspect to me about the world that you created, which are the demons. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, for example, are they supposed to be a manifestation of a soul as opposed to an inner self? What gave you the idea for demons? Why did you call them demons, considering they're such an integral part of the human being in that world? Mm -hmm. Um, and what did you really mean to show by creating sort of this dichotomy within an individual? Uh, demons, yes. Well, uh, demon is the fourth word in the entire story. Lyra and her demon, it begins. And um, it's the one thing, I suppose, that people remember most clearly about the story, that everybody in Lyra's world has a demon, which is the physical manifestation of an aspect of themselves in animal form. Um, I didn't start with this idea. It, it, it came to me after I'd tried to start the book several times and failed because I needed someone for Lyra to talk to. And um, <laughs> it, uh, it, was, it was another uh, illustration of the, the great value of the best piece of advice any writer has ever offered his grateful readers, which is, Raymond Chandler's, when in doubt, have a man come through the door with a gun. In this case, it wasn't a man with a gun, it was, it was but it's someone else, someone you're not expecting. I wasn't expecting the demon to turn up, but suddenly there he was, and Lyra had a demon, and everybody had a demon, and the, oh, that's a different world. And then I realized what I could do with the demon, one of the things being children's demons change shape and adults' demons are fixed, and I thought, yes, that's, that, that helps, because the story is kind of about the difference between innocence and experience in William Blake's terms, and the demon is a visual indicator of that. But I'm still learning things I can do with the demon. It's a very uh, rich idea, probably the best idea I've ever had. Um, uh, it's a very interesting idea. I, Lyra learns a bit more about the demon in the World of the Dead sequence in The Amber Spyglass. She learns that there are three parts of us, as body, and demon and ghost, um, which kind of parallels the um, the Christian. I can't quite remember what it is. Is body, soul, and spirit, or something? Body, soul, and mind, something like that. Um, anyway, the demon is part of that, and um, I, I found it very useful. And I'm still learning things about demons. So perhaps I'll know when I come to the end when there's nothing more to discover about demons. Going back to the member's question, is there a specific reason you decided to call them demons? demons? Oh yes, well uh, it's a good word with um, good Greek root. The word daimon does mean something like attendant spirit or guardian angel or something of that sort. So it's a word with good classical roots. Um, American publishers were anxious about it, an American. <laughs> um, but they had to take, accept it in the end. Could we go to the hand in the very back, please? Uh, obviously, his Dark Materials is very inspirational, but the ending to me also felt quite defeatist in the sense that you know, fate does iron wedges drive and there's no way that Will and Lyra can stay together and Asriel never completes his grand project. Uh, how, how do you sort of reconcile that, and in particular with your humanism and the idea of, I, I guess, like con uh, making progress towards the future with the sort of setbacks at the end of the series? Uh, the story had to end like that. It, wasn't, it wouldn't have been um, successful if I'd let them stay together, if I'd, if I'd given it a happy ending. It wouldn't have worked so well. Um, I was kind of working towards that all the way through. But more than the event, I was working towards that mood of the final scene when they say goodbye in the Botanic Gardens. Uh, that mood of intense love and sadness and... Um, it was summed up best for me, that particular mood, by a piece of music I heard on the car radio as I was coming, my wife and I were driving home from the National Theatre when they were doing the play. And by chance, we put it on Radio 3, and there was a piece of music which exactly summed up the kind of mood I was hoping to describe. And it turned out to be a short piece by 
Edward Elgar called Sospiri, um, which I'm hoping to persuade the TV people to use um, if, they get, if they get as far as that, um, that scene. Um, I mean, it couldn't have been any other way. I know people are sad. Well, I, I was sad too when I was writing it. Can we go to the member in the first row, please? In the striped top. Thank you so much for coming. It's such a pleasure to meet you. I'm a writer, and there are two things I struggle with. And one is writing more quickly and being more productive. And one is how to not let you know, life events that may stress you out or make you, you know, put you in a bad mood affect your writing. Because I'm always quite conscious that when I'm working on a story, then I don't want you know, a, a bad mood essentially to, to change that story, to, to change how I write mm. about those characters. And when I write, I think, I was reading Demon Voices and I've really been enjoying it. And uh, one thing when you wrote about how um, you, need to be, you need to write down sentences, otherwise you're going to always think about all the ways in which a story could have gone, all the ways that you didn't write the story. And I think I'm probably sometimes feeling paralyzed because I want it to be good and I don't often edit a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I put so much pressure yeah. on when I write. <laughs> and I would love it if I could be more productive. <laughs> OK, well, don't worry about um, speed. Um, worry about routine. Well, don't, don't worry about routine. Your best friend is habit. Habit has written far more books than talent has, actually. Um, you, can't, you, you, you can't decide to be talented, um, nor can you descend to be lucky. Uh, talent, hard work, and luck are the three essential elements that you need for success in any field. And the only one you can do anything about is hard work. Uh, but habit will help you do that. Um, write every day. Write um, a regular amount every day, and there will pl come plenty of days when you think, oh, God, this is terrible. This is the worst, not even the worst thing I've written, it's the worst thing anybody's ever written. It is dead, it's hopeless, it's empty. Oh, why did I start this? I'm never going to finish it. It usually comes around page 70. <laughs> so once you get past that page 70, um, you're, you know, you've established a habit. And um, that's your best friend. People make the mistake of thinking that what you need is inspiration. No, you don't. I read a very good sentence in um, the poet Don Patterson's book of aphorisms uh, recently. He said, um, inspiration is a reward for good work. Isn't that good? It's not something you need to start, without which you can't start, you get inspired if you work well and if you work, you know, steadily. So work steadily. As for the, the, the being in the right mood thing, um, you can write about sorrow if you're feeling on top of the world. You can write about um, uh, joy when you're down in the dumps. Um, it's a good way of... Well, 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 you, you, you know, you can be objective about these things. Inhabit the... Um, the, the voice of your narrator, whether it's a first-person narrator or a third-person or whatever it might happen to be. Um, get into the habit of writing a, a regular amount every day, however much you have time for, um, and whenever you can do it. I, the, 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 the ranks of writers for children used to be full of people who were ex-teachers, who knew what children read, who knew what other books for children were available, and who went into that field very successfully. That's not happening so much now. It can't, because teachers now have no time. Um, no spare time to write in. Uh, so write whenever you can, but every day if you can. So when you're working through that book that you talk about, you're on page 70, did you ever think, oh, you know, I'm really annoyed by this story, I can't get myself to finish it, do you just then pick up and do a different one, or do you force yourself to keep writing it? No, I always go through it. I recognise, I, it's an old friend now, page 70. <laughs> and if you're really stuck, if you're genuinely stuck, well, there's always Raymond Chandler's advice, bring someone into the story that you weren't expecting, that'll ginger it up no end. Or, if you're really, really stuck, gin is a great help. <laughs>
Thank you. And, Thank you um, so much. So is dialogue. I write three pages by hand. I write three pages. And if, in moments of despair, I really can't seem to finish it, um, a page or two like this. Hello. Hello. I haven't seen you for a while. No. What have you been doing? Oh, I've been around. How about you? Yeah, me too. It's half a page already. <laughs> Can we go to the hand in the second row, please? Oh, me? Yes, can you just wait for the mic to come, please? Oh, thank you very much. Lovely to hear you reading your work. That was great joy. Um, I'm very interested in what you say about imagination, that that's because you then describe our world which is a poverty of imagination that just thinks that, you know, making money and, you know, buying and selling and going shopping every Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon is what life is all about. And I, I hope that you feel that your books are going to kind of enlarge people's imagination so that they could start thinking, you know, because people, you know, of my generation who grew up with kind of Tolkien and all that, you know, we feel that we've, we've had our imagination en enriched and we can't participate in that kind of world. That's too narrow a, a thing for us to do, you know. Mm. So we do other things. Um, I, that's sort of really sad because children in primary school seem to be have their imagination a little bit fed. And then the secondary school comes and, you know, the sort of Wordsworthian thing, now everything closes in and you've got to pass exams and, you know, get on and get a career yeah. and that's what it's all about. So how can we use this, you know, enlarge the imagination? Because that is what's creating the world. We're creating the world with our imagination. And the world we're creating at the moment is appalling. Uh, the business of school teaching and um, the decline of reading um, is, a, is, a, is a story that makes me angry every time I think of it. Reducing a book to a series of tests about what's an adjective and what's an adverb and uh, uh, all that sort of rubbish it's a, it's a heresy, it's a, it's a travesty, it's a terrible, terrible thing to do. Um, what teachers need and what children need, above all else, is books and time to read them. And plenty of books. And they need a library in their school, and they need a trained librarian there who's read all the books and who knows exactly what to, book to, to, to give to this boy next or that girl next. That's what they need, um, but they have, they're not getting it at the moment. And it's, it's, it's terribly wrong. All this emphasis on fronted adverbials and, and all that sort of stuff. Fronted adverbial is a thing that nobody had heard of before some civil servant invented it about 20 years ago. Now, every seven-year-old has to know what a fronted adverbial is and write sentences showing that with, with fronted adverbials in them. So everything comes out like a, um, you know, out of a sausage machine. It's all similar. It's all the same. This is a terrible thing to do to our language, it's a terrible thing to do to our children, it's a terrible thing to do to our civilization. Uh, there are so many things that need reform, but education is certainly up there with them, with the most important of them. Books and time, that's what we need. Adults need time to read these we kind all need of books. Time. They don't read these kind of books, do they? No, we all need time. We all need more time than we've got. Um, the, the sort of houses they're selling now, little tiny houses um, for people to sleep in, basically, because they've got to get up early and go to work, and they come back late, and they're too tired to do anything, so they go to bed. That's the kind of rabbit hutch society we're creating, and it's all terribly wrong. And I'm very old, and I've had enough of it. <laughs> well, thank you for your books and the imagination. Thank you. Could we go to the hand in, on the right over there, please? Hello. Um, I was just wondering what your writing desk looked like and whether there is a window near it. Sorry? Um, she asked what your writing desk looks like. Oh, I see what my writing desk Yeah, it cluttered. Immensely cluttered. It's full of, full of important bits and pieces that I can't work without, such as my, um, uh, my little barometer that my son gave me. 
and uh, a little stone bear that somebody else gave me, and um, a piece of string that I might need for something one day, and uh, my old Afghan hat that I keep my pens in, and uh, my pen knife for whittling bits of wood that I sometimes find lying around on my desk when I, when I need to find something else. And what else is there on my... Uh, all sorts of things on my desk. Um, three piles of paper. Uh, one pile is the, the book, the, the, the actual text of the book I'm writing. Another pile is the notes I've made for it. And the third pile is the stuff I've written but crossed out and thrown away. But I don't throw it away, I keep it. So those, those three things. A whole slew of books and maps and things. It's terribly untidy. Uh, I... I, I I, I, I'm incapable, of, but this is, this is true of, I'm incapable of seeing a horizontal surface without covering it with all sorts of stuff. So it's a mess, but um, I can't work in any other way. Thank you. Can we go to the hand in the second row, please? Thank you, thank you so much for being here. This has been such a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, I possibly have a two-part question. First, um, if you have any very fond or humorous memories of your time at Exeter College in Oxford, it would be really interesting to hear um, some of your fondest memories from that. And a very quick question, which you may have already been asked, but if you had a demon, what would it be and why? Mine would be a sea otter. Uh, my, my, my demon is probably um, well, I like to think she's a raven, but she might be a magpie or a crow or a jackdaw. Um, a corvid, one of those birds that steals things. A clever because, bird, though. Um, you know, that's what we do, really. Um, what was the other question? Do one I remember anything fondest. about Exeter College? No, it's all a blank. <laughs> um, this was the 60s. And I'm not standing for leader of the Tory party, so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I remember the friends I made, one of them sitting in the audience. Um, and I remember the, the, the laughter. And I remember the drinking, and I remember the... Um, the there, was, there was one term when we were very keen on betting on the horses. So one of my friends had a system. And... <laughs> We used to spend quite a lot of time at the bookies. And um, I think we came out even, so his system must have sort of worked. Oh, silly things like that. But they all go in my memoirs, if, if I can retrieve them from that foggy, delirious blank. Well, I look forward to reading it. Thank you. Okay. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Could we go to the hand at the end of the row over there, please? Um, yeah, there. The, with the blonde hair, yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming here to speak to us today, and um, thank you for your books. I think they played a big part in my coming here because I'd never met anyone who'd gone to Oxford, but I fell in love with Oxford through your books. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us if Will maintains any connection to the university in his world. A, a connection to the university? Um, yeah, whether Will maintains any connection to the Oxford University in his world. Oh, I see. Um, well, I'm always pleased to get an invitation to come and speak. Um, and uh, I'm an honorary fellow of Exeter College, um, and that entitles me... I don't know what it entitles me to, oh, but... Sorry, I mean, it's Will in his world. Um, Will in his world. Um, yes, his world is our world. Um, so, uh, sorry, I thought the question was about me. Um, <laughs> Will. Um, Will, well, I can't tell you very much about Will, because if I write about him, um, I want to keep the things I know kind of private. But one thing I can tell you, in one of the editions of His Dark Materials, I had a little section at the back called Lantern Slides, and I showed little, little sketches of other things around the story which weren't part of the story. And I, there was one I did about Will, um, and I, I, I talked about Will about the age that Lyra is in the new book, and he seems to be a medical student. And because he knows his demon, and he can see his demon, and she can see other demons, whereas most people can't, he's very good at um, 
one of the things doctors have to do, which is diagnosing things. Um, in fact, sometimes he has to pretend to get it wrong or it looks as if he's, he's, you know, cheating or something. But that's an intriguing situation. What about a person with a demon in our world? What, how do they get on? So maybe, I, maybe there's a will story I haven't written yet. Um, I'll have to do some medical research, won't I? <laughs> to find a body to cut up. I think we have time for one more question. Um, could we go to the hand in the second row, please? How has uh, being a writer for most of your life changed how you see or interact with the world? And then on top of that, how has it changed how you um, read other works of fiction? How does being a writer change the way you see the world? Um, I'm not sure because um, all writers are different and all people are different, but I had a brief um, exchange of correspondence with a philosopher recently um, who is a panpsychist. Um, he believes that consciousness is, uh, everything is conscious. Atoms, stones, grasshoppers, um, consciousness pervades everything. And this is an idea that intrigues me. So we had a brief talk about that. And he was um, intrigued to hear what I said about um, the way I think, because he thinks that narrative, n narrativity is not a central, it, well, for him it's not, a, it's not a, of central importance, it's not something that his mind does. But it very much is part of what, what, what my mind does. Um, anything, for me, can set off a story, not because I'm consciously doing it, I suppose I've always done it, but if, for example, uh, my wife showed me something this, this, uh, at lunchtime today, she's got a wooden book stand on the, on the kitchen table, and she showed me something I hadn't seen, which is a little sparkle inside the design on it. And immediately I was thinking, oh, what, what if there's something hidden in there? What if my mind was automatically doing that? I wasn't sort of consciously thinking, um, oh, I could make a story, what could I do? Let me see, I could... It was, th the story was telling itself um, without my intending it to. Uh, so I suppose in a sense I've always done that. I can't remember a time when I didn't do that. I've, I thought it was what everybody did. Perhaps I don't. What was the second part of your question? Or perhaps that was the second part. Yeah, how, how has it changed how you read other works of fiction? Oh, other works of literature. Well, I'm very interested always in this narration business. Who's telling the story? Where is the camera? Um, and uh, different writers, of course, um, have different solutions. Some writers only tell stories in the first person. I don't do that because I find that a bit limiting. I want, don't want to be stuck in one person's consciousness. I want to be able to float a bit more freely than that. And then other, other people, a lot of people now, tell stories in the present tense, which to me is, is nonsensical because how can you, um, while you are doing something, be talking to me about it? It's this sort of logical oddity about the present tense that I can't get my head around. So I find reading books in the present tense rather hard. Um, it's a bit tough on my friends who do write books in the present tense, so I have to pretend I've read them. <laughs> um, but other than that, I don't know. I don't know, really. I, do, I read a lot of thrillers. Oh. I'm very keen on thrillers. I think we stop? do have time for one more question. So could we go to the member okay. right in front of you, please? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm really glad to have heard from you because when I read His Dark Materials, that was one of the best trilogies that I read growing up. And I recently read La Belle Sauvage, but um, I haven't yet read Lyra's Oxford. And I read online that some fans have said Malcolm and Alice might have been in um, Lyra's Oxford, so I was wondering if when you wrote that you kind of knew that you wanted to bring them back in future books and if you kind of um, had an idea of what would happen and who they would be for Lyra all along. Um, I'm not sure I got the whole of that question, but the, the, gist, the gist of it was that did I, when I was writing Lyra's Oxford... Yeah, if you thought about um, who Malcolm and Alice oh, yeah, or yeah, Nabelle yeah, Sauvage yeah. would be. 
Not, not specifically, but um, when, you're writing, uh, when you're writing a kind of story that extends over several volumes, uh, it's, it's, it's quite tempting occasionally to write a bit that doesn't, have a, doesn't lead anywhere in this story, because you know you can pick it up in the next. Um, loose ends are a, are a great friend. Yes, the, the person who wants to know what to do when you start, leave a lot of loose ends in your story around. Then you can go back and pick one up and people will say, oh, wasn't that clever? Ooh, was she, was, how did she think of that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, there were loose ends. There were loose ends all over the place. By the time you get to the end, though, all your loose ends come home to roost. Um, so when you, um, when you decided to bring in Malcolm and Alice in this series, why them? Why, how did you decide that? They just occurred to me. Um, as characters do, they just turned up. Um, I liked Alice from the start, and the, the, when I first encountered her, she wasn't going to have a very big part in the story, but then I realized, oh no, she's much more important than that. Um, when you have characters who don't like each other, uh, that's always a, there's a good, strong dynamic in that, and that can get a story going. If it's, I mean, a story is about things going wrong, isn't it? It's impossible to write a story in which everybody's happy and nothing goes wrong. I wonder if anybody's done it. <laughs> it's very hard. Because if nothing goes wrong and everybody's happy, there's no story. Well, there we are. That's your literature lesson for today. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking Sir Philip. Thank you very much.